What is up, everyone, and welcome back to TwimmelFest. Uh, I am super excited for our keynote interview today. Uh, I'll be welcoming Susanna Illich up in just a moment, but I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, talk about some of the great sessions we've got uh, so far this week uh, and some of the things that we've got to come. Um, well, like I said, we've had some great sessions so far this week. Uh, in particular, I wanted to shout out a couple of highly interactive opportunities that we started this week, but that it is not too late to join in on. Uh, the first is our code names competition, where you can join in a contest to build a bot to play the code names game. Uh, we had a launch for that session yesterday, but we will be continuing that activity throughout uh, TwimbleFest, uh, throughout the month of October. Uh, and likewise, we also launched our AI for Good Hackathon. This is where you can use NLP to try to identify uh, evidence of, um, try to uh, assess companies' statements of uh, regarding modern slavery. Um, those that information for those sessions can be found on their session pages. Uh, and like I said, it is not too late to join. Still to come this week, later today is a deep learning for time series workshop that has proven to be quite popular uh, and a NLP office hours session tomorrow in which former guests of the podcast will answer your questions about natural language processing. Uh, next week, we've got a packed agenda, including keynotes with Jeremy Howard and Milan Tambe. Uh, we've got a trivia tournament that we're all super excited about on Wednesday evening. And of course, our screening of the Coded Bias film. Uh, and new to the agenda, we've got a style GAN workshop in which you can uh, roll up your sleeves and generate some art uh, using style GAN. All right, so uh, that is it for uh, our highlights for TwimbleFest. I hope you are really enjoying the start of uh, this AI festival. Uh, we've got a bunch more to come. Our uh, unconference is still open for both submissions and voting for another day, so be sure to check that out. Uh, you can access that via the TwimbleFest site. Uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome on Susanna. Hi, Sam. Hi, Susanna. Welcome to TwimbleFest. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. I am super excited to chat with you about what you've been up to. Uh, we had a pre-call the other day and so much interesting stuff. Uh, let's get started by having you share a little bit about your background. How did you come to work in uh, machine learning and AI? I think I have a bit of an unusual background maybe to be in AI. So I'm a domain expert in AI, actually. I'm uh, currently a computational linguist and a product owner at Causally, an AI startup based in London, where I'm working on causality extraction from biomedical text. Um, which is very, very exciting. I um, just joined recently, about six months ago, and recently moved to London. And before that, I was based in Japan, in Tokyo, for four years, and my master's brought me there. So my academic education is in applied linguistics. So I'm a linguist in, in AI. And, you know, at some point, I was always working in natural language processing with smaller scale data sets. So a couple of hundred texts started with that, very manual work. 
then a couple of thousands, couple of hundred thousands. And at some point I, I realized I needed more complex um, approaches, more complex computational approaches. And I started reading about machine learning and I was absolutely fascinated by learning algorithms and knew this is the direction I want to take. Um, I moved to Japan, started my PhD in applied linguistics and got my first research position at the National Institute of Informatics where I was working on deep learning for, for effective computing, the field that I'm in, emotion recognition from text. Um, mm -hmm. Then shortly after that, I, I started working in a, in a contract position for Google Japan where I was working on natural language understanding um, at a very different scale. So moving from small scale to very big scale um, and it changed kind of my way of approaching data work, approaching language and making very strategic decisions about language um, that ideally scales across millions of documents. And while I was doing that, I, I started an initiative called MLT. And I think maybe that's the one that people know about. MLT is a nonprofit organization that helps people learn about machine learning and, and really get into machine learning, deep learning and related fields. Um, and we have about 7,000 members right now. We're growing globally since we moved all of our efforts online. Maybe you have similar experience with Twimmel AI, with the Twimmel AI community. And very, very happy to, to see MLT grow. That's awesome. Now, I've got to ask, Nihongo ga wakarimasu ka? Eto, mada chotto, chotto muzukashii to mon desu kedo. Well, it's still a bit hard for me, but um, yeah, it's That's okay. Awesome. So folks that uh, have listened to the podcast regularly know that languages is one of my things. Uh, mm. It's usually cramming before a trip. And pretty much the only thing that I remember about Japanese is uh, asking that whether you understand Japanese and Shinjuku eki wa doku desu ka? How to get to <laughs> Shinjuku train station. Uh, That's a good one. That, I'm out of luck. Oh, you have to know how to order, right? If you're in a restaurant, you say, Timasen, o susume wa nan desu ka? So what's what's the recommendation? Please get it for me. Nice. So that's nice. How did you enjoy the, Japan? I absolutely loved it. So I, I worked very hard, um, but I was also very fortunate to have had a lot of really great opportunities there for, for professional development and growth. And apart from that, Japan is just a, a wonderful country, wonderful people. And Tokyo, I, I still miss Tokyo. Um, even though I love London, I, I learned to love it, but Tokyo is still pretty amazing, yeah. That's awesome, awesome. Uh, and so your work at Causally, um, you uh, tell us just a bit about the use case there. You mentioned that um, you're applying uh, causal causality to uh, research documents. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm leading the development of the, our causality extraction module, which is at the core of our product. And the product is a knowledge platform uh, related to human health. We're building a, um, or we built a biomedical research tool for, for scientists and, and research teams and, and other people working in health related domains. And uh, the interesting thing about this in our CTO would say it's a paradigm shift in, in the way we do literature search, because what, we, what we're you know, traditionally doing is keyword search, co-occurrence, but what we do at Causally is, um, we identify causal relationships, which is very important for biomedicine because it is a very evidence-driven um, field. And um, the way we do that is we extract causal relationships. We are able to determine um, the causal strength of this relationship between different concepts. These concepts could be, for example, genes or chemicals or disorders and diseases. And we find these interactions, we find these causal relationships, we determine its strength, its causal strength. That means if we have on a very abstract level, if we would say A causes B compared to A is associated with B, we have a different causal strength, which is very relevant as an evidence point for a biomedical researcher. And on top of that, we built another uh, module that determines its directionality. So it's also very important in what kind of direction this causal relationship uh, is said to be. Um, for example, if we take A increases B, it's a clear up directionality, whereas if we would say A is associated with B, it's a bi-directional relationship. So this is from the NLP perspective. Now, what we can do with the product that is built on top of that NLP uh, engine 
is, is, is very, very interesting because it allows a researcher to ask very complex questions, to search for concepts, to search, for example, causes, effects, side effects, treatments, biomarkers, all of these different things that are in some sort of causal relationship with other concepts in just a few clicks. So that means they can ask very complex questions in very novel ways. And what would usually take a research scientist days or weeks to search with traditional search methods, it only takes a few seconds with, with our product. And uh, probably also a very interesting aspect, which is not necessarily not uh, NLP, but the way our front end team built the UI and the UX around that builds how we represent knowledge is another very important aspect. You want to have this in an interactive way. You want to have a tool that is very visual, that is very intuitive to use. So it's not only about getting the right information, getting the exact evidence you need for your questions, but also in a way that is really intuitive and easy to use. Hmm. I'm really intrigued about the the use of causality for this use case. I've had a few interviews with folks that have worked on similar things. I think this is the first time causality has come up as uh, a fundamental uh, technique. Some of the others were using um, applying NLP to research literature in the materials science domain to identify, for example, candidate materials that have a given set of properties. Uh, is uh, Before we get into causality, is that a similar uh, type of use that someone might have for what you're doing? Um, the, the use cases in our case are, the, there's a very broad range of use cases on how you can use this platform. Um, one would be uh, preclinical safety or drug safety. So you're identifying uh, risk factors for a very specific chemical or a very specific drug. Um, and, you know, at the company, we have uh, scientific liaisons that are our domain experts in the biomedical, um, in the biomedical field. And they really help to navigate like how you can get the most value out of the, the tool that we have. Um, so there is a lot of different use cases uh, very much depending in what kind of field you are, from translational medicine all the way to preclinical safety, drug discovery, etc. So, um, yeah, pretty exciting. And I do have to say, you're right, because when a few months ago, earlier this year, when I was, you know, deciding to move into a new role, I was actually researching about, you know, what kind of companies are out there to do innovative stuff in NLP. Like, I want to see something really cool, something unusual, and I stumbled upon causally and realize, okay, nobody else is doing this. This is this is very interesting and probably a problem space in, in NLP that is fascinating, right? So it, it's yeah. it's reasoning, it's causality, it's, it's super fascinating. For me as a linguist and a computational linguist, fascinating to work with. But I also realized, okay, wow, so the use cases here in biomedicine and, and health related domains um, could be really a game changer in, in the industry. Agreed. Yeah, causal, causality and causal modeling and machine learning is something that we've talked about uh, a bit within our community. Uh, we launched with Robert Ness a course on causal modeling and machine learning uh, earlier this good. year. Uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we're, we've got our third cohort of folks going through that course now. And it is a, a different way of thinking about uh, machine learning. Did you already know about causal modeling when you started at Causally? Um, no, it, it's really my first time to to step into the to causality as such. And um, yeah, there's many different approaches how you can you can probably tackle that. And I'm very now that you're saying that sounds super interesting. So I'll definitely take a look at your course. Awesome, awesome. Cool. So. Uh, you mentioned in your bio MLT, and we want to really dig into your um, experiences with building that community. Um, you mentioned in our pre-call that MLT started with just a couple of folks in a co-working space, just kind of hacking on machine learning. You know, tell us more about that that story. And that's exactly what happened, Sam. Um, <laughs> so literally, we were two people and um, two domain experts. So Yuvraj, uh, he's, he's a software engineer uh, with, a, with, a, with an education in, in electronics and hardware. Um, and myself, I'm a linguist and, and really needed to get into machine learning hands-on. So 
And I, it was not enough for, for me to read about it on a very high level and just get a high level understanding. We really wanted to write code. And, and that's what we did. And we were hacking basically um, full day, Saturday morning until evening until they kicked us out from the co-working space. And every week more and more people joined us. And at some point, um, it kind of, you know, developed itself and, and evolved as a community and grew um, until we started, you know, organizing dedicated, dedicated sessions, dedicated workshops with instructors that walk people through code bases, train models, um, also do, do theory. And um, that's how it kind of evolved and grew over time. And uh, one and a half years ago, we established MLT as a nonprofit organization. Um, which was very, very exciting for us because um, it kind of moved from, you know, being a hacky um, kind of place for coders into a nonprofit that is dedicated to open education that really wants to include all, all kinds of people, people with different backgrounds uh, into the discussion of machine learning um, hands on. And um, so we held in the past three years more than 250 uh, workshops talks, study sessions, and and, uh, and panel discussions. And we keep growing. Um, we keep growing like beyond the, the borders of Japan right now with, with moving everything online, as mentioned before, which is very exciting. We now have team leads, obviously, in, in based in Japan, but also based in India with Sanyam and Mirtanjay, who are team leads in Canada, in Europe, uh, in the US. So so very excited about, about how how it really evolved from from being a passion and being something we wanted to learn for ourselves into an organization and the community that that is growing and evolving globally. Was there a particular point where uh, it became clear to you that this was switching from a kind of scratching your own itch uh, kind of thing that you were doing and other folks were just kind of tagging along to, you know, you starting to do it, you know, more for other people? I think so, yes. At some point, um, it th there was certainly like a point where I realized, okay, this is growing just beyond what I intended it to be um, into something bigger. And I think the the kind of the, the game changer for us was when when I met Taizo San, who is who is a, a serial entrepreneur in, in Japan. He's um he's not only investing in startups, but he's also um, supporting uh, nonprofit organizations. And he built a startup called Vivita. And Vivita is, a, is an interactive, collaborative, creative tech space for kids. Uh, so kids can come in and they can explore and experiment with hardware and software. And we met and we kind of had the same vision. You know, we wanted to, to build this interactive, collaborative space. Uh, even though I was, with, you know, with adults uh, and students and professionals, in the machine learning space, and he was more in the creative space for kids. We mm -hmm. kind of shared the same mission, and he was supporting MLT that allowed us to uh, establish um, MLT as a nonprofit and not only um, provide the platform for people, not only provide the community for people, but also provide the resources that are needed in order to get started with actual projects. And this was also the time when we started working on hands on projects. In the field of AI for social good, we established an, an edge AI lab um, with folks who are working on hardware and deep learning for hardware for different kinds of applications. Um, we, we continued to develop our open education efforts. We published research. So we did uh, a bit of research uh, as well in NLP and, and also in the hardware uh, edge kind of space. And uh, from, from then on, I realized, okay, this is becoming something bigger than, than initially thought, but very happy about it. So. It took all that. It took all that. <laughs> it took <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, so the, yeah. the, this Edge AI lab is super intriguing. Uh, tell us more about what you do under that umbrella. It started from an initiative where we, the, the projects that we built were, you know, I wanted to have a direction where we have AI for social good. So we're not building products for companies or commercializing products. We, if we build something as a community, we're building something for a public benefit for the community or for, for social good. And it started with uh, us collaborating with a, um, with a community in Chiba, which is one of the surrounding cities of Tokyo. 
and it's a it's a hacker community of farmers slash technologists hmm. and we visited them and we we did the first project that we worked on in the in this rural area was an agritech uh, project so we worked with a suspended robot and we built deep learning models that could run on small microcontrollers um, in order to to either move a robot or do different tasks pick and place object detection and other things hmm. and from then kind of it led uh, one thing led to the other. I think the most recent one, which was very exciting for us, was a team from that AGI lab that participated in an AGI competition organized by the Japanese government. So those guys were working with actual um, traffic data from Tokyo and were supposed to build an object tracking system um, that is, is supposed to be deployed on, on hardware, on a Jetson Nano or an FPGA. And our team worked very hard. Um, I. Uh, I was there every once in a while in meetings, and they were extremely worked extremely hard, achieved gold medal and the third prize. Um, wow. So we're very excited about that. So a lot of different initiatives in in the AGI space. A lot of very interesting people also who who are in that lab, who are in the community. From Ben, who is a drone engineer, uh, to Naveen, who is an absolute expert when it comes to these edge devices and deployments, uh, research scientists at Riken. Um, so super super exciting stuff. Awesome, awesome. And, and remind me, what was the project that won in that competition? So the, the goal was to build an object detection and object tracking system. And uh, people were competing. Um, so I'm not sure like what was the, the how different the winning project was. Yeah. But in, in yeah, in our case, it um, yeah, was, was a very we had several people working on different components of the model um, using retina net and um, a ResNet is a backbone, I think, and then building on top of that. Awesome, awesome. You also mentioned, uh, and I've got to say, this is super fascinating to me and, and very impressive that MLT has published research papers and, and you know has, has been engaging in research. Tell us a little bit more about that effort and how it got started. So first of all, we, we really, we really love collaborating with universities. In, in Japan, uh, typically structures are very traditional and it's very unusual to have this open collaboration. So open science is something we really want to foster and to support. So we have different um, projects, ongoing projects with universities. For example, last year, we were at the Tokyo Institute of Technology where we held a two-day boot camp uh, in machine learning for researchers at the Earth Life Sciences Institute. So we're talking about biologists, chemists, planetary scientists. So all these researchers work with different kinds of data and um, we're introducing machine learning to them as a potential approach, as a potential method in order to solve their, their problems. So this is one way how we're contributing to research. The other ways um, that we're actually working on research. So last year, it, it also started kind of as, as a more independent initiative of um, two different projects that were ongoing. One of them was in the NLP um, field where I was more involved in. So for NLP, for example, we submitted something to the NURIPS uh, machine learning for creativity and design. And what we built was um, we used generative adversarial networks for creative text generation. So we wanted to explore different kinds of uh, training and pre-training methods, different kinds of data sources in order to build models that generate interesting creative text. And we specifically will, was targeting, we were specifically targeting metaphors, poetry, lyrics, and, and um, other things in, in the creative text space. Um, that was very exciting and very interesting. Uh, we, we did publish that in, in the workshop. The other one was related to the Edge AI project that I mentioned before that. We submitted one of the projects to NURIPS uh, workshop um, machine learning for the developing world. And the reason for that is, and this is less theoretical than it is applied, is how to think about machine learning and edge devices in, in places where we have constraints, right? So edge devices are very helpful um, when it comes to, it's very low cost to acquire, it's very low cost in maintenance. Um, when you run it, it can adapt to, to certain you know, differences in your, in your environment. Um, and it can just accelerate um, accelerate um, the, the the food production, for example, in agriculture. And when we think about 
uh, developing countries, food production and agriculture is one of the main incomes for people, one of the, ma the major sources of income as well as one of the major sources for food production. So we need to come up with ways how we can utilize technology in those resource constraint, in those resource constraint, uh, where we have those resource constraints. Uh, let's rephrase mm -hmm. it a bit. Um, so that's that's how we use deep learning for these edge devices in, in an agricultural context for specifically um, yeah, developing countries where we have limited resources. Interesting. Yeah, when I it, uh, the uh, a lot of the keynotes that we're doing uh, during Twimmel Fest, if not all of them, are, are you know with folks that have been influential, you know, in the broader ML AI community or their specific uh, ML AI communities and. It may be obvious, but one of my kind of, uh, you know, background uh, desires is to just learn from folks that have, you know, been been pushing communities forward and, you know, what interesting things they're doing that we should be maybe thinking about doing. And the thing that I find, or at least one of the things that I find super interesting about, you know, what you've done at MLT uh, is this research uh, agenda that you've taken on. We've it, actually through this causality course that I've mentioned, we've had a couple of students uh, in that course in the first cohort of that course end up working on papers with the course instructor with Robert, uh, which we're super excited about. Uh, but I'm, I'd love to hear from folks in our community who might be interested in doing independent research projects and if that's something that we could you know organize organize around or help support folks um are there it sounds a little bit like it's an early effort and it's evolved a little bit organically uh around uh a few folks and their personal research interests has it have you kind of institutionalized it uh beyond that or is that kind of where it is right now it's definitely where it is right now because okay. you know as you as you mentioned i also believe independent research is something that i'm absolutely interested in and if it is community driven it's something else you know because research is very hard work it's not something mm -hmm. that you do on the side or or just kind of you know um you know comes up it's it's something that you very hard you know work on um and for us, it, it really has been very difficult to transition into, let's put it this way, institutionalizing, because it requires not only resources, but um, resources in the sense that um, you, it, communities are har hardly ever self-organizing. So it needs mm -hmm. structure, it needs a target, it needs a direction. And um, these are things that are still very hard to accomplish for an open community or for, for like independent research initiatives. And that's why I think you're right. It, at some point, uh, you know, if it's just as it is right now, uh, it will never evolve. It will just stay just a few folks who are interested in research. Um, but in order to really make this something something great and something valuable, it, it probably has to be at least in the direction of in, institutionalizing it or, or giving it some structure. So that will be the end goal. Let's see Let's see where, where it will go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I interviewed Andreas Madsen a while back, who's a independent uh, researcher. If I'm remembering the story correctly, he um, tried to get uh, tried to join a PhD program or or get a particular PhD advisor or something like that, and they didn't ha they wouldn't have him, uh, and so he went on to kind of do his research independently and ended up getting published in one of the major conferences or journals. Yeah. Um, and, uh, when you ask him, like, what's his main advice for being an independent researcher, I think it's don't, right? It's really don't do hard. it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, find, you know, try hard. Don't do what I did. Try harder to find some affiliation because it's really, really hard. It's um, really hard. But yes. And, it, but his story is super inspiring. So he's done a phenomenal job. So yeah. Yeah. But it, it certainly requires, a ton of commitment. What's interesting in here to me is can uh, community provide the support that uh, a formal institution, you know, might provide? So maybe folks doing quote unquote independent research in the context of a community 
maybe, you know, is there a structure that can make it so they're not as independent as, you know, someone as Andreas was, they have support, they have folks that can make, help them make connections. They have mentorship, things like that. Uh, interesting, you know, potential things to think about. Absolutely. I agree. And it probably has to be something in between, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very hard to do it in a very open, uh, self-organizing way, but it also doesn't have to be fully institutionalized, uh, if, if you will, but it can be something in between and you get the best of, of all worlds um, collaborating with, with uh, you know, universities or institutes. So I, I really do believe that there's a lot of different possibilities and opportunities if, if you, you know, put a bit of thought into it and, and some time and dedication. Mm -hmm. I want to pull in a question from uh, one of our listeners. Alisher is curious, what inspires you uh, and, and who inspires you out in the AI and ML community? Um, well, I'm inspired by a lot of things. I'm inspired by initiatives. Um, for example, I absolutely love what Hugging Face is doing. They're truly democratizing NLP, open sourcing, making it very, very easy for people to use. Even for me as, as a linguist, I can so quickly prototype a transformer, a pre-trained language model and just test and evaluate uh, my model. So this inspires me. Like companies that do open source uh, is something that that I, I just um, really appreciate. And this is also something that we appreciate as MLT, um, open source projects. Um, I'm also inspired by, um, you know, people like, um, uh, David Ha, for example, who is a research scientist at Google Brain, who has a very unusual background himself. And his research is, is absolutely fascinating. So he comes up with very unique, um, unique approaches in, in machine learning and, and very unique ways of, of doing research. So this is something else that I'm inspired by. And I think um, just generally being in MLT and being in the midst of it, and I just briefly talked with Jose uh, about it from Twimble AI uh, before that, is just being in the middle of a community where where people learn from each other um, collaboratively, where they work together towards uh, something that they're genuinely interested in, something that they want to push. Um, it's it's something that is inspiring. So we we keep working on projects, and I and people are putting so much time into into teaching other people or 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 coding and building projects, and. Um, it's it's absolutely inspiring and and i'm i'm very grateful i think it's a it's a really unique community and a really phenomenal community and i'm inspired by our members yeah absolutely absolutely uh another question by uh from anupam um going back to causal modeling maybe talk a little bit about uh how you how you learned it? What were some of your key resources in coming up to speed with uh, causal modeling? So, because I'm working on a product, I I won't be able to to talk about it in any technical detail. But as I mentioned before, there's uh, many different ways how to approach uh, causality, and um, of course, there's also uh, causal modeling in the Judea Pearl um, sense, where you where you model a very specific a form of causality. The other one is you, you start at the very beginning where you have explicit causal relationships and that requires yet another, uh, yet another uh, computational approach but also a different design approach and, and um, architectures. Um, and what I would suggest, I would just look into the course that Sam just mentioned. That sounds pretty wonderful to me as a, as a good starting point. Awesome. Um, I'm curious about your transition from the domain expert to uh, machine learning practitioner. Um, maybe let's dig in a little bit deeper on, you know, what that was like for you and how the sessions that you, you know, essentially MLT helped you make that transition. Yeah, uh, it was it was quite quite difficult. So coming from an unusual background means that you have to catch up with a lot of things that you typically don't have during your your education or in in typical curricula. So um, I had to take every opportunity to learn about different things, um, hands on as well as theoretical approaches. And uh, but I do have to say, so I am still a linguist. 
and I am passionate about solving language problems. And I'm not the machine learning engineer in that sense. I'm also not a computer scientist. Um, what I do is I, I, I work or I spend most of my time working on data, understanding language, understanding the problem at hand and the task, um, understanding the property of that data. And then I study algorithms and models and then I prototype. And when I study these, these algorithms, I study, you know, I want to find the, the model that solves my problem. Not necessarily a particular one, not necessarily the fanciest one or the state of the art one. It has to solve my problem. And then I quickly prototype. Um, and I, I, I really want, as a linguist, I wanted to understand properties of algorithms, um, their needs, their weaknesses, their strengths in order to prepare um, that data for, for modeling. And then I spend very little time on actually engineering or architecting. What I look at is the output. I evaluate what did that model learn and I interpret it and I make decisions if that's good enough or not. And then I go back and reiterate. So my work indeed is like really mostly on data, on making strategic language decisions, um, designing the system um, and then evaluating uh, the output and doing quality assessment and uh, going back into uh, reiteration. So um, from, the, from from that perspective, it's it's not I'm not a machine learning engineer. I'm definitely the domain expert. Mm -hmm. um, so that is collaborating with engineers and, and computer scientists. It, it reminds me of uh, an interview that I did recently with Emily Bender, which ties into a question that Miguel asks. Uh, the I think we ended up titling that interview, uh, Are There Enough Linguists in Natural Language Processing? Um, uh, kind of speaking to this idea that NLP in a lot of ways has developed into a, a field of study, not necessarily divorced from, but you know, separate from kind of the fundamentals that linguists learn when they're studying languages. You know, all statistical uh, as opposed to based on the languages themselves. Um, and I'm curious, you if and, and Miguel is also curious, kind of your take on that relationship between linguistics and uh, NLP and, and machine learning. So I was always in an environment where where it was very multidisciplinary. So, uh, for example, in my previous jobs, linguistics and engineering or, or AI and, and machine learning really goes hand in hand. Um, and I think this is a very good approach. AI is multidisciplinary. It's not, uh, especially when we're working on products, we need to understand social implications. Uh, we need to understand data. We need to understand models and we need to understand how they are deployed uh, with what kind of impact. So I do believe there is a very big need for, for linguists or domain experts in general um, in AI. So we are working with, uh, as I mentioned, uh, linguistics, linguists, engineers, and biomedical researchers, scientific liaisons. So all of that goes hand in hand in order to build the best NLP system that we can build. So I think it's crucial, uh, especially when you're in industry working on, on, on products, um, but there needs to be also this, this collaborative way of, of making things happen. And I think that's where we're still kind of at the very beginnings uh, of understanding how we can bring disciplines together to actually build systems that, that can be deployed uh, in, in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of being in, in, in industry and owning products, um, you are the, the product owner for their, your particular product. So in addition to um, you know, working on the NLP side of things, in addition to bringing domain expertise to the problem, you also need to think about how all of that comes together and creates a, a product. Uh, I'm curious if there are any things that you've learned uh, about, about that aspect that are, you know, unique and, and non-obvious. Unique and non-obvious. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good point. So I was in my previous jobs always uh, in between those two, in between very technical work and this project uh, management or, or as a product owner. Um, and typically in a very technical position, you focus on problem solving. So you focus on, on, on the very technical problem solving. As a product owner, you start your work um, before that. So you really have to have a full view on the product. 
um, you're you're owning its its technical development, um, but always with you know the very specific targets in mind. So what you want as a target as a as a product owner is to maximize the impact of your product. So when you're when you go into planning phase, you have to have the full full view of uh, your team, the where you are, your backlog, what needs to be done, um, what kind of things have could potentially have what kind of impact. And when I'm talking about maximizing the, the, the impact of a product, I mean to maximize the, the value for our users. So you really have to have all of these things in mind. So it's not about only you know, solving a technical problem. It's having the bigger picture um, always, always in mind and um, like making decisions very strategically towards that goal. And once you go into the technical development and the implementation, you know, you plan and you design your sprints and you, um, you do quality assessment and you uh, reiterate the development cycle. So uh, for me personally, it's very exciting to do both. I love doing the technical work because, you know, you just do your own thing and you're, you're, um, you're very occupied with the technical work, which is great. Um, but I also really like thinking about, you know, the bigger picture. How does that product actually bring value to our users and how can we maximize its impact? Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that there are unique opportunities in product for folks that understand ML and AI uh, deeply? Absolutely, I think so, yeah. Um, I think it, it's, obviously there are very specific roles, right? As a, as a product manager, you have very specific responsibilities. As a product owner, it's it's maybe more technical than, uh, than customer oriented, but uh, having a very deep understanding of machine learning and, and deep learning is going to help you make better decisions for the product overall and vice versa. I think if you're a very technical person, but you have an understanding of what what does it actually mean that I'm working on? What is it? What kind of value does it bring for the company or for the user? I think uh, this has huge value for the company and for the user. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely um, a place for for that as well. Yeah, on a related note to product, one of the things that you mentioned in talking about causally was the emphasis on the the user experience, the UI. Uh, that's something that I used to talk about quite a bit early on in the days in the podcast, uh, you know, early in the podcast. And to some extent to, to this day, you know, I would, uh, I would, uh, you know, there were certain things I was trying to figure out uh, about kind of what folks were doing. And, and one of those things early on was, um, is anyone thinking about, you know, the, the unique principles of design you know, in the context of machine learning and AI and, you know, more general when the product has a statistical probabilistic, um, you know, background or, mm. or mechanisms as opposed to kind of the way people expect things to, to work now, which is maybe more deterministic. Um, and I, I thought for a long time, but was not seeing any, you know, body of work evolving around designing with that in mind. Uh, it seems like we've come a bit of, of a way since then. I, I see folks talking about it. I'm curious if that's something that's expressed in the way you uh, build the product. If there are things that uh, you are doing from a design perspective that are kind of unique to uh to the product being based on machine learning and or causality. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it, it again goes back to the previous, um, previous question that we discussed. AI is indeed multidisciplinary and it really requires this cross-functional communication across teams, um, especially when we're talking about, about products. Um, and in our case, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, it's sort of a paradigm shift, right? We're moving from from you know um, traditional search, deterministic search, if you will, to something very different. Um, and and UI and UX is a very important component for us. The front end is is one of the most uh, critical aspects because you want, as you mentioned correctly, right? People are used to doing certain things in a very certain way. Now this this doesn't apply only to machine learning. Just in general, when you're introducing innovation. And when you're introducing new technology, that's always something to think about. 
and obviously in in the um, the age of AI and data, um, it requires yet another approach maybe of thinking about how is the user going to perceive this? How is, is it intuitive? Does it make sense? Um, and we put quite a lot of effort into our UI and UX um, and our designer and front end team. Um, the communication is always there and it's always very important towards the user, but also towards the NLP team. So having this cross-functional communication with the user in mind when you're bringing innovative and new technology is something very critical, I think. Mm. A uh, question from Larry uh, is focused on causality applied across multiple languages. We know the statistical approaches to NLP can often be language neutral. Um, does that apply to causal techniques as well? So we currently work only with English because uh, the the research bodies is just science is, is mostly written in English. So we're working with English. Um, again, like there's different approaches and some of them might apply for different different languages as well, right? So we um, we we see that all the time that we we build uh, models for different languages in the in the causal um, in the causality area. It's something that is probably very critical, and this is coming from maybe also linguistic theory, uh, it's less about syntax, maybe if we're talking about uh, different different languages. If we think about Japanese, for example, causality might be expressed in a different way than it is in English. So there's certainly things that are language specific as for anything in language modeling. And on the other hand, there might be uh, similarities where you can uh, use maybe similar computational approaches um, so, but in our case, we're working uh, purely with, with English. Awesome. Patrick is curious what got you interested in linguistics uh, at all? Is it primarily around an interest in language or an interest in how the brain works or, or something altogether different? Uh, actually, when I was interviewing, somebody asked me if I regret not studying computer science. <laughs> because I'm, you know, very deeply into, into, into machine learning. And I said, no, I did not. I think I studied the right thing. I'm very, very fascinated by language and thought, by reasoning, by uh -huh. how the brain works, how we express things. I have always been. Um, and studying linguistics really opened up like a very, very interesting opportunities for me to think about language. So when you start studying linguistics, you you know, acquire some typical theoretical knowledge about it, like syntax, morphology, semantics, and all these things. And then you get into more interesting things like argumentation theory and logic um, and different patterns um, that you kind of use uh, in different scenarios. And with applied linguistics, you can use all that knowledge uh, and break into tech uh, as I did and work on a larger scale with, with data and different computational approaches. And I do think that I, you know, studied the right thing and I still do. I absolutely yeah. love solving language problems. That's exactly my thing. Um, and as I mentioned, I also enjoy, you know, learning about algorithms, um, writing codes and, and thinking about product. So I, for me personally, you know, couldn't be any better. Awesome, awesome. Uh, question from Claudia, when you are thinking about building a, a product, how do you balance uh, the desire to, you know, maybe use the newest, shiniest thing versus, um, you know, more traditional, mm. stable approaches. Do you do you use, you know, without revealing state secrets, do you use GPT-3 and uh, cause it? <laughs> or are you looking at that kind of technology? You know, what I can, what I can tell you is that, and, and industry is as pragmatic as I am, um, you know, you want to solve your problem. And you don't need the fanciest algorithm of all that is going to be, you know, um, that it has 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 to be trained on on GPU clusters, and it's going to cost a fortune. And then you you can't really explain it, and um, you know, getting you into trouble here and there. Uh, what you want is to solve your problem. You want to build a system and to use the models and to use the computational approaches that most efficiently solve your problem, and that includes. Um, you know, also thinking about um, um, things like, um, as I just mentioned, resources, right? 
um, accuracy, performance. And this is a trade-off that you have to make. So you, you kind of have to strike that balance between, okay, here's a problem. How do I solve that problem in the most efficient way? And then you go and choose the right method for you. Um, you test it, you experiment with it, you evaluate it, and you reiterate if necessary. Um, so in that regard, research and, and, and industry is quite different. So in industry, we have a much, much more pragmatic view on things. And I think uh, Chip Huen, actually, who, who um, is a phenomenal machine learning engineer, she just published recently a slide deck on that, how she explains the differences between machine learning research and machine learning in production. And it's quite a difference. So uh, mm. you absolutely don't take the shiniest models if they're, if they're not solving your problem or if they're not the best model to solve your problem. If they are, then you go for it. Uh, so your your comments there in some ways uh, echoed or or uh, at least brought to mind for me some of your work in MLT um, in, in the sense that you've got when you're working with edge types of use cases you've got tremendous resources resource constraints you're, when you're working with developing uh, communities or countries you often have resource constraints. Uh, and I'm curious the connection between your work professionally and your work in the community. Does your work in the community make you a better professional or uh, th does that exposure kind of enhance you as uh, in your career? I think it does in multiple ways. So, you know, being part of the community um, really helps me learn about things. Um, if I if I want to experiment with certain things or learn about cer certain things, um, this is a platform for me to do so. And that's very similar to Twimmel AI. So it allows you, it gives you the opportunity to be creative, to try out things, to experiment with things. Um, and, and that's how you grow in that, in that kind of very particular direction. And that also helps me as a professional. In, in, as a professional, you typically, when you work on a product, you need to build things that work, that are reliable and robust. And uh, there's sometimes not much space for, for creativity and, and, um, um, and experimentation, but you really need to, uh, to deliver a, a product that, that um, delivers the maximum value for, for your user and customer. So both, both of these things kind of go hand in hand. Um, and it just makes, makes me probably a, a more, um, well, grounded uh, professional, I would say, having, having to have uh, the opportunity to experience both. And I, I do believe it's for many members kind of they share this notion of, uh, you know, experimenting and, and just working on things um, without, without pressure. And at the same time, you, you get uh, a lot of responsibility. For example, when you're leading a team, this might be the first time for you to lead a team, right? To lead a project. So this is also a way to gain professional experience. For me, certainly, uh, before I started MLT four years ago, uh, I was definitely not in a senior position where I could have said, okay, I can lead teams or I can set the direction for, for software or for a project. Um, four years later, after my professional experience, as well as the MLT experience that I had with you know, publishing research papers, uh, but also like building projects ourselves, um, I think it allowed me to grow professionally as well. A uh, question here from Sanyam. Uh, shout out to Sanyam, someone who's been active in both the Twimmel and MLT communities, among others, Fast AI as well. Yes. How you do it, brother. Um, but uh, is there a particular achievement or project by the community that you're most proud of? There's not a particular thing, um, but what I can say, and hi, Sanyam, by the way, um, is the community as a whole. So there's literally, I, I just said we held 250 workshops and this is community. This is the members who are teaching other people, who are guiding other people. Um, this is people who spend their weekends uh, building projects traveling to Chiba, to, the, to a rural area where there's nothing in a radius of two hours. 
and traveling there, talking to farmers, asking them how they can help with building technology. It's it's all of these things, like all, all of the little projects that we build, all of the members that are contributing their time and their effort for others, um, but also for themselves. I just mentioned, you know, this is also part of, of our own professional development, of our own, you know, need for, you know, uh, to kind of satisfy our curiosity and our interest and to work on things that we might have never had the chance to work on. So all of these little projects, all of these little things, our core team, our team leads, um, I'm, I'm very proud of. And um, yeah, thanks, Sanyam, for the great question. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Susanna, thanks so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you've been up to, uh, both at Causally and MLT and uh, in your career, super, super fascinating conversation. Uh, and I wish you and your community the, the best of luck. Thank you so much. It was really great being here and I'm very excited about your program. I saw a really great interactive session, so I'll be definitely there. Awesome. Thanks, Susanna. And thanks everyone for joining. Enjoy the rest of Twimblefest. We've got, as I mentioned at the beginning, a ton more uh, to come, be sure to check out the TwimmelFest site, twimmelfest.com, uh, and the agenda. And uh, please 